If you have your Bibles this morning, if you would go with me to the Gospel of John. Let's pick up chapter 20. If you would keep your Bibles open this morning, we're going to consider verses 19 through 31. As you're turning, let me set you up for just just a minute here. I read an article here a couple weeks ago that the present generation is looking for, I believe it was four things in leadership. One of them was integrity, but one of them was honesty, to be real, to be transparent. And I I say that this morning because I want the young people, anything under the age of 20 to hear me this morning as I preach because this is a moment where we're going to attempt to be honest with you and just come clean with some of the struggles that we have as Christians. I understand that's important for us to put our best foot forward. We want people to think the best of us. But so often we come to church with mask, a facade, and so often we fail people by not telling them the truth. Now you can connect that to the statement that I made here several months ago where I said spiritual, super spiritual people don't don't inspire or influence, they intimidate. Because they fail to tell the truth. They fail to tell the truth that they struggle just like everyone else. For Paul said that we are men of like passion. And I think it's important that leadership, that people be honest with one another and simply state the fact that we all struggle with things. Here in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31, we have the story of the second appearance of Jesus. Remember, this is after the resurrection. Jesus has appeared to the disciples the first time. But now we find him coming back the second time. Let's pick it up in verse 19. It says, on the evening of that first day, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews... Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. If you're taking notes this morning, why don't you title this a faithless moment or a faithless visit? You see, these guys are on the job the first day. It's the first day on the job here. I mean, they're just learning how to operate without Jesus after his death and his resurrection. They're just getting started. And the fact is, these guys have managed to lose him. They've lost him. They don't know where he's at. They've managed to lose the body of Christ. Now, remember that Jesus did not have a plan B. He just had a plan A. He invested everything he had in 12 men, and one of them betrayed him. So there's 11 men left, and the entire future of the church of Jesus Christ, including you and I, rests upon these 11 men. If they get this right, it's great. If they don't, then we've got a mess on our hands. So we got 11 guys that have been placed in charge. Jesus said to them in John chapter, is it 15? He said to them, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. And he gave them the keys to the family business. And he left them in charge of the work that he started. And there is no backup plan. Everything rests with these 11 guys. And their first day on the job, they've managed to lose God. They're in an upper room somewhere with the shutters closed, the doors locked, the lights turned down low, and they're scared to death. They're off to a great start. And in the midst of of this faithless moment, Jesus shows up. I just want to point out to you in this story that it wasn't their faith that brought Jesus, but their fear. 
The Bible makes it clear that they were afraid. You see, God often comes when you least expect him or deserve his presence. Now, there's a reality, there's an honesty that Christians need to come to grips with. These guys are in a room with the shutters closed, the doors locked, the lights turned down. They're afraid, they're fearful that what the, what the Romans and the Jews did to Jesus, they're going to do to them. They don't know what to do. And yet, in the midst of that, Jesus shows up. It wasn't their faith that brought him. It was their fear. It was their need. Sometimes God shows up when you least expect him and when you absolutely do not deserve him. Some of you will remember a couple of years ago, a few years ago, I preached a message entitled The Mercy Miracle. And I talked about a a miracle that comes simply because of the mercy of God. Not because you deserve it, not because you earned it, but simply because God is good. Sometimes God just shows up because God is good. I want to ask you this morning, have you ever received an unexplainable blessing? Have you ever received something that you just could not explain to people? Didn't do anything to deserve this or or, or earn this. You see, as you look at this verse 19, the reason I want to highlight that verse is because I want you to see that the frailty of man reveals the faithfulness of God. In this moment of fear, uncertainty, confusion, we've lost God. One of the 12 has betrayed him. We've got uh, a traitor in the midst of us. He went out and killed himself. This thing is coming unraveled. The wheels are coming off the wagon. And into this moment, Jesus shows up. In the midst of man's frailty, God's Faithfulness comes through. Sometimes God just comes when you don't deserve them. Has God ever showed up in your faithless moment? Have you ever had God just show up when you were fearful, unsure, and unfaithful? Think about it. God's faithfulness. Look at verse 20. After he said this, peace be with you, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive you the Holy Spirit. Then he said, if you forgive anyone, they're forgiven. If you don't, then they're not. They were shocked that Jesus showed up. It makes it clear there in verse 20, they were shocked. He showed up when they least expected him. They were probably a little embarrassed at the way they were acting, acting, and yet he showed up, shocked them, caught them off guard. And he said, peace be with you guys. And he said, now listen, let me talk to you for just a moment because something is not right here. He said in verses uh, uh, 23, if you forgive anyone, Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, I want you to notice that he said, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. I'm commissioning you. Then he breathed on them, and he said, I want you to receive the Holy Spirit. And then he said, whoever you forgive will be forgiven. Okay? Are you with me this morning? Whoever you forgive will be forgiven. Now, I just want to pose this question to you. Is it possible that Jesus was making a statement to these men? He was trying to make something clear to them. Is it possible that he was trying to show them something? Just maybe. Now, as I said, there were two visitations of Jesus and I said this was the, the second one. Actually, this is the, uh, uh, the first one here. I, I apologize. The first visit, we know that Thomas was not there. We understand in the first visit, Thomas was not there. The second visit, Thomas was. But I just want to show something to you. Perhaps Jesus was saying to these guys, where is Thomas at? He said to them, I've sent you. I want you to receive something. I'm going to uh, challenge you to forgive people. Perhaps Jesus was asking the question 
uh, without asking it, where is Thomas? Where's Thomas at? He wasn't in the first visit, but he was in the second visit. And perhaps Jesus was asking these guys, where is Thomas? Because can you imagine how they felt? I want your mind and your imagination to go with me for just a moment. Judas has already portrayed Christ. And in the first visit that Jesus makes, Thomas is not there. You remember the disciples told Thomas and said, we've seen the Lord. And Thomas said, unless I see his hands and his side, I won't believe. Can you imagine how they felt? Can you imagine? They're, they're, they're starting to question themselves. They're already filled with fear and confusion. Judas has betrayed. Thomas is absent. Thomas is what the, we call doubting Thomas. And now they're struggling with this thing. Everything is coming unraveled. And Jesus is looking at these guys and challenging them. I want you to learn to forgive. Because in 1 Corinthians... In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14 through 26, it talks about the body being made up of many members, and we have to be careful that we don't say to one another, I don't need you. The hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you. The eye can't say to the ear, I don't need you. And perhaps Jesus was trying to get their attention and saying, guys, listen, I'm sending you to give what I've given you, and I want you to learn to forgive one another. Where's Thomas at? Where is Thomas? In the first visit, where is Thomas at? You're not complete without Thomas. Don't give up on Thomas. Don't assume the attitude that I don't need you. Is it possible that we've mislabeled Thomas I grew up hearing the Sunday school stories of Doubting Thomas. How many of you? Doubting Thomas, Doubting Thomas. But you know, in John chapter 11 and in verse 16, Thomas is the one who stepped up and said, I will go with you even if it costs me my life. Maybe in this moment, Thomas is not so much doubting as Thomas is just discouraged. Is there anyone in here that's ever been discouraged? I'm here this morning to challenge your thinking. In the first visit, Thomas wasn't there. The second visit, he was. But Jesus says to these guys, don't give up on Thomas. I want you to learn to forgive. I want you to understand that you're not complete without one another. You see, we gave Thomas a permanent name over a temporary situation. For just a moment, Thomas was discouraged. And in that moment, we labeled him Doubting Thomas. How many have ever talked about Doubting Thomas? We've spread the rumor, we gossiped, we talked about him, but perhaps Thomas was more discouraged than he was doubting because he's the guy who stepped up and said, I will die for you. He had one moment that created a permanent name. You see, men will define you by one moment of discouragement. And that's the point that I'm trying to highlight in verse 23. If you forgive men, they will be forgiven. But if you don't, then they won't. Do you know when we, when we refuse to forgive men, we empower them to remain in their weakness? Oh, guys, I, I'm preaching better. I'm preaching better than you're, you're participating here. You see, when I look at a man and I make a statement, once a drunk, always a drunk, I empower him to stay in his weakness. When I look at a young person and say, once a, once a drug addict, always a drug addict, I empower them to stay in that weakness. When we refuse to forgive men, we give them a license to stay in their weakness. That's why it's so imperative that you capture verse 23. Forgive and they shall be forgiven. 
If you don't forgive, they won't be forgiven. You empower them to remain in their weakness when you refuse to forgive them and to see them other than. How many times have we given people permanent titles out of temporary situations? Maybe he wasn't doubting Thomas. Maybe he was just discouraged Thomas and he needed somebody to be patient with him. Where's Thomas at? Where's Thomas at? Perhaps the second visit was to remind the disciples that the value of the whole is determined by the presence of the one. First visit, Thomas is not there. He talks about forgiveness. We don't know the story. Maybe they were in that upper room, the doors locked, the lights down, fearful. Thomas is absent, and they were talking. Well, I guess Thomas is going to be another Judas. Where's Thomas at? Why didn't he show up? Where's he at? I thought we were a team. I thought we were going to support one another. You know, these are tough times. We need to hang together. Where's Thomas at? And in the midst of that, Jesus shows up and says, hey, guys, peace, chill. I'm sending you out to represent me as I represented the Father. You need to do what I did You need to count the 99 sheep and discover that there's one missing and you need to go look for the one. Why? Because the the value of the whole is determined by the presence of the one. The value of the whole is determined by the presence of the one. Jesus was willing to leave the 99 and go look for the one. I want to ask you this morning. Do we really believe in the one? The the value of this congregation is not found in its numbers. The value of this congregation is found in the one. We count people because people count. And when you see an empty chair, you realize there's a brother that's missing. There's a sister that's missing. And you understand that without them, we are incomplete. We're not whole without them. So the value of the whole is found in the presence of the one. So we leave the 99 and we go look for the one. Because we value the one. We place value in one another. We are not caught in the trap of 1 Corinthians 12 where it says, I don't need you. We need one another. We're made complete by one another. Who is the Thomas that is not with us today? Who, who, who is the Thomas? You see, we need to tell them, we will wait for you. We will wait for you. We will wait for you. We will wait until you catch up. We will wait for you. We will bring you along. I'm talking about discipleship. I'm talking about the value of the one. I'm talking about building a community of believers. I'm talking about understanding relationship. I'm talking about understanding how important people are. That it's not just about big church. A bigger church is not better. More people? Yes. Because we're in the people business. Want to reach more people. More sinners need to get saved. Amen? But a bigger church is not better. People. We're in the people business. And so we have to keep our focus on the value of the one. Jesus comes in the midst of a group of men. And he says to them, in essence, where is Thomas? Where is he? Look at verse 24. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the disciples, or excuse me, so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, unless I see the nails, marks in his hands, and put my finger where his nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. I want you to notice in verse 24, Thomas called Didymus was not with them. Now, the word Didymus, I looked this up, oh, a year ago. Interesting word. I looked the name up a year ago. 
And the, and the name Didymus means twin. It, it doesn't mean that you have a twin. It means you are a twin. It doesn't mean you have a twin brother or a twin sister. It means that you, as a person, a singular person, you are a twin. You are. You remember Romans chapter 7, where Paul said, When I would do good, I find that evil is present with me. I do that which I would not. I can't do that which I would. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this twin? In Galatians, Paul speaks about the flesh lusting against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. He talks about the conflict that a spiritual man is in, where the spiritual mind and the carnal mind is warring against one another. He talked about that in, is it Romans chapter 8? He talks about to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. He talks about the conflict that a man has, and we find that here in this story. We find the struggle between Thomas and Didymus. You see, at the first appearance... Thomas, at the first appearance of Jesus, Thomas, because of Didymus, was a no-show. He wasn't there in the first appearance of Jesus. Jesus comes into the upper room, the, 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 uh, the ten are there, and he kind of asks the question, Where, where's Thomas at? Uh, you guys have been talking about him. Where, where's Thomas at? Where's he at? You see, Thomas because of Didymus was a no-show. He didn't show up. They couldn't count on him when they needed to, when the chips were down. And I'm here this morning just to ask you for a brief moment, can we be honest with one another and answer the question, have you ever been a no-show? Have you ever been a no-show as a Christian? Have you ever been a no-show as a, a spouse? Have you ever been a no-show as a parent, as a friend, as a brother, as a father, as a husband, a mother, a wife? Have we ever been a no-show? Have you ever just not been there? You see, these guys were counting on Jesus or counting on, on Thomas. How many of you agree that this is a critical moment? These guys have left everything they, they had. They left everything they believed. They put their life, their reputation, everything on the line. They follow after this radical uh, uh, evangelist from Nazareth. And, and, and they go about preaching and doing good. And then the church rises up and crucifies him, kills him, puts him in the ground. And then his body goes missing. Now they're in an upper room. Shutters are closed. Doors are locked. Lights are down. They're huddled in a corner. And they're sitting there trying to say, what do we do? Where do we go to? from here. There's nothing in the manual for this one. What did Jesus say to us? Where's Thomas? Thomas was a no-show when they needed him. I just asked the question this morning, have we ever been a no-show? No-show. Has there ever been a time when I wasn't there when I needed to be there? On the job, I just I just wasn't there as a Christian when I needed to be there. As a father, as a husband, as a, as a friend, as a pastor, has there ever been a time when there was a no-show? I just, I just couldn't be there. Have you ever come to church and everyone around you was worshiping and engaging and enjoying the presence of God and you just was a no-show? I didn't feel like worshiping. I didn't feel like participating. I didn't feel like engaging. Are there any no-shows in the house today? <laughs> You've heard me tell the story in 96 when I went through the, what we call the dark night of the soul and go to Brownsville Revival and sit down between Brenda and Suzanne and the presence would fall and they, all, they both reacted the same way. Suzanne would fall this way, Brenda would fall this way, and I would just sit there like a no-show. And I'm the one that needs it more than anybody. And I resent this. I do. God's touching them and not touching me. And I needed it more than anyone. 
and just felt like a no-show, just not engaging, not participating. I want to ask you this morning for just a moment, can you be honest? Because you see, true ministry begins when we're able to get past Thomas and deal with Didymus. Ministry doesn't play, take place with Thomas. That, listen, that's not who it really takes place with. Ministry takes place when you move past Thomas and you go to the twin, the I inside, and you deal with Didymus. That's where true ministry takes place. Or you can, you can talk to Thomas. How you doing, Thomas? Oh, brother, I am so good. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. How you doing, Thomas? God is good all the time. How you doing, Thomas? Amen. Hallelujah. Isn't Jesus good? Amen. How many Thomases are in the house? Just amen. But you see, ministry doesn't play, take place there with Thomas. It's not until I get past Thomas and I get to the twin behind him whose name is Didymus. That's when it takes place. How's Didymus doing? Didymus is afraid. Didymus is unsure. Didymus is confused. Didymus is a no-show. That's where ministry takes place. And it's time the church comes to this reality. And that's what I want to say to these young people. You think pastor has it together. That's good. <laughs> you think pastor walks around his house with angelic music playing and speaking in tongues But the fact is, every Thomas has a Didymus. And there are times when Didymus is a no-show. Just don't show up. Just can't engage. And there are times when he gets discouraged. And we owe that to this generation to tell them the truth. Because, you see, they're dealing with their Didymus. They're dealing with their Didymus, and they're convinced they're the only ones. That's why super spiritual people do not inspire. They intimidate because they fail to tell you the truth. I'm not talking about sin. I'm not talking about cheap grace. Don't go there. I'm talking about the struggle that every man, every woman deals with. Even the apostle Paul said, when I would do good, I find that Didymus is there. Didymus. Who shall deliver me from this Didymus that I deal with? The God that's a no-show how do I overcome him? True ministry, true ministry begins there. Not with Thomas, who we appear to be, but Didymus, who we really are. You see, Thomas will always conceal the pain and the reality of Didymus. Always. He will always conceal his pain. But ministry remains superficial. As long as we spend our time dealing with Thomas and not Didymus. Thomas will never be free until we deal with Didymus, the other me. The other me. That's what we've got to deal with. We've got to confront Didymus. Look at verse 25. Verse 25. The disciple said, we've seen the Lord. He said, I won't believe it until I see the scars in his body. I want to talk to you real quickly about three words, faith, doubt, and believing. Now, let me just give you this real quick. Faith is a conviction, doctrine. It's what I believe. Believing is trusting, confidence in God, in his faithfulness. Doubting in the Greek means uh, to judge, to make a decision, to distinguish between two things. Three words in the Greek, a doctrine, trusting God, and making a decision. Faith, believing, and doubt. And these are three things that we all deal with. You see, you need to understand 
that the presence of doubt is not the absence of faith. You can have faith. You can have a conviction. You can have a doctrine. This is who I am. This is what I believe. And yet, though you're a man of faith, you can have moments of doubt where you are making a decision. You are making a judgment. It actually carries with it legal overtones. It's a decision. You put yourself in a position to make a decision, to judge something. That's doubt. Believing is simply obedience to God, trusting in his faithfulness. And there's the difference. And there's the struggle that we all face. Thomas Didymus said, except I see, I will not believe. Except I see. He's a no-show. You see, Thomas is a guy that is happily married. Thomas is one that loves church. Thomas is the one that loves people. Thomas is the one that believes God. And the other one is the no-show. And the reason I bring this out is because we're never going to understand people and be able to minister to them effectively until we understand their complexity. Because you can't go by Thomas. Because Thomas has got it together. But Didymus is the no-show. He's the one that struggles with doubt. And we're never going to minister to people until we understand that complexity. Because the presence of doubt does not mean the absence of faith. You see, you have to refuse to let your doubt keep your faith from believing. And there's the struggle. My faith has a conviction. I can't let doubt come in and cause my faith to stop believing God. Trusting him. His faithfulness submitted to him, believing God. God is good. God will do me right. Doubt wants you to make a decision. Doubt wants you to judge something. Doubt wants you to to put yourself in a position to make a legal ruling on the situation. That's what doubt does. Doubt comes in and says, you make a decision. That's why Paul said, to be carnally minded is death. Believing simply says, I trust God. Yeah, but the circumstances say this doesn't matter. I trust God. But your situation says this doesn't matter. I'm not going to pull God's word down to my circumstances. I'm going to pull my circumstances up to God's word. I am not going to allow my circumstances to determine or dictate what I believe. Won't do it. I don't have to make a judgment on this. I don't have to. God's in control. I submit to God. I believe God. I don't understand why he died. I don't understand why he was buried. I don't understand the resurrection. I don't understand why the church wants to kill us. But I know this one thing. Jesus is the son of God. And I will not retreat from that position. I choose to believe in him. Where is he? I don't know. But I choose to believe in him. Doubt wants you to make a judgment, a decision on something. Doubts, 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 doubts. Not sure. Doubt comes. Is there anyone in here that's ever had a doubt? Is there anyone in here who's ever had a moment of discouragement where you doubted something? Where Didymus rose up and got the upper hand. The lesson that we learn here and this story from Thomas is this. Now, remember, this is on the first day of the week. This is Sunday for them. I mean, this is Sunday. Their Sabbath is on Saturday. But this is the first day of the week, Sunday. On their Sunday, this is the lesson. On Sunday, bring your doubts to Jesus. Bring them. Remember, Jesus shows up second time to Thomas. Bring your doubts to to Jesus. We need to learn to tell people it's okay to be afraid. Just don't give in to your fear. It's okay at, to be discouraged. Just don't lose your faith. It's okay to struggle. But greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. 
We're more than conquerors through Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's okay sometimes. It's okay to be honest sometimes and say, I don't understand. Even Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane prayed, if it be thy will, Father, if there's any other way to do this, then, then let's, let's, let's do this, but I submit to thy will. I yield to your will. I had a missionary one time, a great man of God, Jacques Verneau, in the Congo. He was going back to the Congo, and, and it may cost him his life. And he sat with me one day, and he said, am I afraid? Yes, I am, but I will go anyway. Does, is there moments when I'm not sure? Yes, but I will go anyway. There's moments when we all deal with didymus, and we need to be honest with that and bring our didymus to church. Bring our doubts to church. I wish I could tell you that I'm always sure, but I'm not. And sometimes I reach down and I grab Didymus by the nap of the neck and I say, come on, where are we going? You're going to church. You're going to church. You're going to church. Bring your doubts to Jesus. Thomas was there the second time. Bring your doubts to Jesus or your doubts will take you to unbelief. Bring your doubts to Jesus. I don't have a problem with people dragging Didymus in here and sitting him down and say, you will come to church. You will pay attention. You will worship God. You are going to sit there. Sit right there. Because it's called the renewing of the mind. Renewing your mind by the washing of the word. Drag your Didymus to church. Bring your doubts or your doubts will bring you to unbelief. You say, I'm not sure. Well, bring them on. You say, well, I don't know about that. Well, bring it on. Tell people. People say, well, the church is full of hypocrites. Well, come on anyway. One more won't hurt. Come on with us. People say, well, I'm not sure. Well, come on, neither are we. People say, well, I've got doubts. So do we. Come on, just lump it in here with us. We'll work through it. I'm not advocating unbelief. You know that. I'm telling you, though, doubts will come. But bring your doubts to Jesus or your doubts will take you to unbelief. Bring them to Jesus. There's nothing wrong with saying, I don't understand. I go into prayer many times and holler at God, walk around the house, spit and no cussing, but <laughs> just, I don't understand because my father's big enough. He's big enough. Bring your questions to Jesus or your questions will take you to unbelief. I'm telling you, let it be said at cathedral that doubts are welcome. Do, do we, does, does people have to believe exactly the way we believe on everything before they're welcome at cathedral? Doubts are welcome. We'll work through it together. Look at verse 26, 27. A week later, now this is the second visit. A week later, his disciples were in the house again. Thomas was with them. He brought his denimus to church. He brought his doubts to church. The disciples found him. You can see that up in uh, what verse, uh, verse 24 and 25. They found him and said, Lo, we've seen the Lord. You should have been at church last Sunday. Whew! It was a throwdown. We had a great time. So the second time, he shows up. A week later, he shows up. Thomas comes in. The doors were locked. Jesus walks in, he stood among them and said again, peace be to y'all. Then he turned to Thomas and he said, put your finger here, reach out your hand and touch my side. Stop doubting and start believing. Then Thomas said, wow, my Lord and my God. I want you to look at this. The Bible tells us that a week later, Jesus stood in the midst of them. I believe that's King James Version. It uses the word in the midst of them. And he said to Thomas, I looked up that word mist in the Greek. I thought it was interesting. It means, <laughs> it means the middle person. It means the middle person. There are just two quick things I want to give you. Number one, Jesus came back just for Thomas. The first meeting, Thomas was a no-show. 
So Jesus shows up again. There we go back to the statement, the value of the whole is found in the presence of the one. Jesus came back just for Thomas. Look at verse 25. It says, but Thomas said to them, unless I see the scars. Then in verse 27, it says, then Jesus said to Thomas. Do you see that? First meeting or or with the, the disciples earlier, he says, unless I see some scars, Not going to believe. The second meeting in the upper room, Jesus says to Thomas. But when Thomas was talking to the disciples, Jesus wasn't there. Interesting. You see, God sees me in my fear and even answers my doubts. Okay, I just violated half of your religion. Even when I'm afraid, God sees me. And he even answers my doubts. Think about it. I'm not advocating unbelief. You know that. I'm not advocating fear. You know that. But I am talking about an unexplainable mercy miracle. There are times when God shows up when you don't expect him, when you don't deserve him. There are times when God hears you even in your fear There are times when God even answers your doubts. When you say, I'm just not sure. There are some of you sitting here this morning, you're struggling with doubts. You don't understand. I'm here to tell you this morning that God will answer your doubts. I'm here to tell you this morning that God sees you right where you are. Right where you are. God sees you. God seeks out people with permanent names that came from temporary situations. God seeks out people with permanent names. For 2,000 years, we have called him Doubting Thomas. Perhaps he was just discouraged. For 2,000 years, we've called him Doubting Thomas. Perhaps he just needed a little patience. For 2,000 years, we've called him Doubting Thomas. We've used him as the example of the no-show of what not to be. Children have grown up through Sunday school. How many has ever said, when I get to heaven, I'm going to seek out Abraham? Well, my God, is there anybody? (laughs) Okay. How many has ever said, when I get to heaven, I'm going to see Jesus? Somebody raise your hand before I lose faith in y'all. Is there anybody who's ever said, when I get to heaven, I'm going to sit down with Doubting Thomas? I'm going to tell you, this guy got a raw deal. A permanent name off of a temporary situation. And that's the one that Jesus came back for. He didn't come back for the 10. He came back for the no-show. I'm trying to challenge our thinking here today to understand the value of the whole is found in the one prostitute, the one drug addict, the one alcoholic, the one adulterer, the fornicator, the one, the no-show. The husband that failed, the wife that failed, the kids that strayed, I just want you to understand as a church that we've got to see humanity, understanding they have doubts, but that doesn't disqualify them. Jesus came back the second time for the one that was a no-show, that had questions, that had doubts. He came back for him, not for the 10 preachers that had all the answers, but for the one preacher That just wasn't sure. He showed up for him. And that's why I quoted that scripture to you. Jesus said, I'm sending you. I give you something. Now go give it away. Give away forgiveness. Give away patience. Give away kindness. Believe in people. Show up for the no-show. Come back for the one. Don't give People, permanent names off of 
temporary situations. See past the Thomas, the, the guy that's got it all together. Poofed up, powdered up, sprayed up, lipstick, high heels, dress, suit, and tie, comes to church. Thomas has got it all together. He's got the, the pepsodent smile on the magazine of, uh, of charisma. And yet behind that Thomas, there's a Didymus that's not sure. A Didymus that's got questions. A Didymus that struggles. That's the one Jesus showed up for. That's the one that he came back for. The second thing I want you to see here is Jesus was in the midst or Jesus became the middleman. He said, give me a visual. John chapter 19 tells us that on one side was, a, was it a thief? On the other side, was, a, was it a murderer or a thief? What's the Bible say? Thief. Two criminals on either side. And Jesus is in the middle. Jesus was the middleman. I want to ask you this morning, are you having a crisis of faith? Are you having a crisis of faith? Who's in here this morning that's having a crisis of faith? Where are you? I know you're in this room. You have a crisis of faith. You're not sure. You've got questions. Perhaps you're doubting. You're struggling. You're like Paul who said, when I would do good, I've got Didymus to deal with. I'm trying to be a good husband. I'm trying to be a good wife. I'm trying to be a good Christian. I'm trying to be a good employer. I'm trying to do what's right, pastor. I struggle. Thomas does good, but Didymus, he's a problem. I struggle. Where are you this morning? You're in here. Listen. In Luke chapter 22, Jesus turned to Peter and he said, Peter, you're going to blow it. But I have prayed for you. Not that you won't have moments of doubt. But he said, I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. Because we're all going to have moments of doubt. But Peter, I prayed for you that your faith won't fail. I wish I could tell you that I've never questioned anything. But my old pastor, Brother Clinton, told me, he said, Randy, until you question everything and find the answer for yourself, you never truly believe anything. Don't believe anything just because somebody told you. But you question it for yourself, and then it's yours. I've questioned it, and I believe it. There are moments of doubt. There are moments when there's a crisis of faith. There are moments when we struggle with Didymus. But Jesus said to Peter, you're going to doubt, you're going to stumble, but I pray that your faith, your doctrine, your conviction, the core of who you are doesn't fail. And here's the statement. When you, when you may question God, I find that God never questions me. Let me put it another way. When you are unfaithful to God, God's never unfaithful to me. He's always there because he's the middleman. He's in the mist. When you like faith in God, as in believing, remember God has faith in you. He's the middleman. Peter had a moment of doubt, but Jesus said, Peter, I believe in you, son, and I'm going to pray for you that your faith does not fail because Jesus is the middleman in your mess. Jesus is the middleman in your mess. Upper room, shutters are closed, doors are locked, lights are down. The guys are back together. And number 11, which means disorder, Thomas is there. And Jesus shows up. And he's the middleman. And he says to him, Thomas, I just came back today to let you know that I believe in you. And that made all the difference in the world. Brent, come help me. He came back. 
because he believed in him. He believed in him. Peter, I believe in you, son. Though you are going to doubt me, I believe in you. Jesus gives us a tremendous story here. Tremendous. And I just want you to look at verse 31. Powerful. Look at this. He said, these things, this story is written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and that by believing you may have life in his name. 2,000 years ago, a story takes place so that I today could read it and believe that Jesus is the middleman in my mess, that he will show up when everyone else walks out. He'll leave the 99 to go look for the one. Think about it. He came back just for you, just for you, just for you. Just a simple story about a guy that we call a no-show. You know, I find one more thing that's real interesting. It's powerful. Huh. The Bible tells us in verse, verse 27, he said to Thomas, put your finger right there, son. Right there. Put your hand right here. Touch it. You know what that tells me? That there's a scar for every hurt that you have. And he'll show you right where to touch him. Didymus has doubts. Jesus says, here, touch this. Jesus could have walked in the room and rebuked him and said, Thomas, where were you last week? Well, Jesus, I, you know, I just wasn't sure. How dare you question me? I rebuke you. I cast you out. You're excommunicated. Out of here. You're not one of my team players. But he didn't do that. He walked into the mist and he said to them, Didymus, I heard what you said. So I want you to reach out your hand and touch me right here, son, because there's a scar for every wound that you have. Every wound. You touch it right here. You say, Pastor, I've gone through a divorce. He's got a scar for that one. You say, Pastor, I'm fighting cancer. He's got a scar for that one. You say, Pastor, I'm tormented in my mind. He's got a scar for that one. You say, Pastor, my feet have taken me to places of unrighteousness. He's got a scar for that one. He's got a scar for every wound that you have. And he'll show you right where to touch him. You say, give me a scripture. Hebrews chapter 4, my last one. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of your infirmity, but was in all points. There's a point, there's a scar on, in his, on his body for every wound that's in your life, every one of them. And in a service just like this, he'll show you right where to touch him. When I was a boy, we used to sing this song, Reach Out and Touch the Lord. It says, reach out and touch the Lord as he goes by. You will find he's not too busy to hear your heart's cry. He's passing by this moment. Your needs he'll supply. Just reach out and touch the Lord as he walks by. Would you stand with me this morning? You've been so patient. God bless you.